On October 9, 2003, a successful businessman named Ko Jung Won was on his way home from work, only to find that his home held the most spine-chilling scene. His entire family had been murdered. Upon first entering the home, investigators stated that there was an entrance that led into a bathroom. This is where they found Cole's mother lying on the floor face down. Further into the house, you will walk into the kitchen on the other side of an aquarium. This is where his wife lay collapsed in front of the kitchen sink. Her skull was dented so badly that investigators couldn't tell what the perpetrator used to inflict such damage. The entire flight of stairs leading up to the second floor was covered in blood. The body of his son was just around the corner, seemingly attacked on his way downstairs. His head was struck so many times that brain matter was scattered everywhere. The scene was gruesome, so much so that investigators are still haunted by it to this day. Forensic teams worked hard to find an inkling of evidence to help determine who the perpetrator could be, but it wasn't easy. It appeared that the person responsible tried cleaning the area or was very careful not to leave a trace. Fortunately, investigators were able to collect two faint footprints. What shocked investigators was that none of the slain victims appeared to have fought back leaving officers on the scene to question how this could have happened in broad daylight. With very little evidence to go on, authorities had to begin their investigation on the husband and the people around him. The shock of the incident and now being investigated made Ko Jung Won angered and depressed. He is described as someone who is hardworking, humble, and considerate of others. Within mere minutes, he lost his wife, mother, and son. It seemed the only guilt that Mr. Cole contained was self-inflicted, often lamenting his apologies to his mother, wife, and son that he failed to protect them. He grieved his family so deeply that investigators found it too difficult to identify him as the killer. The investigation seemed to not lead anywhere as authorities found that Mr. Cole was a well-respected man who wasn't the type to provoke resentment from others. No one held any grudges against him or sought vengeance. As officers continued their investigation, they noticed some strange people coming and going around the neighborhood. These strange people were detectives from the Gangnam Police Station. They were scoping the area because they had a similar murder case occur in Xinzadong. However, what no one realized was that this was the beginning of a year-long murder spree by one of South Korea's most prolific serial killers, Yu Yong Chul, a man who was dubbed methodical with a superb attention to detail and extraordinary forethought. Welcome to another episode of Crimson Sin with Tamsin Lee. I am your host, Tamsin Lee. Full show notes and sources can be found at tamsinleecrimsonsin.podbean.com. I just want to say that I'm sorry if my 
pronunciation is wrong, and if I sound kind of weird speaking today, I have a horrible toothache. (laughs) So, again, I'm sorry if I sound weird. I know I always sound kind of strange because I have a very... Sometimes I have a very strong country accent, and I pronounce my R's very hard. So, again, I apologize if I pronounce anything incorrectly or say something strangely, but my tooth is really hurting. (laughs) So today's case is about Yu Yong Chul, also known as the Raincoat Killer, who went on a murdering spree from 2003 to 2004. What surprised me about this case specifically was that he went undetectable for so long and it wasn't necessarily because of police incompetence. It more stemmed from their lack of communication and the perpetrator actually switched up his style and manner of killing which made it seem like some of the crimes he committed was by someone completely different. And as always, this is a case from South Korea. So again, if I don't pronounce a name correctly, I'm sorry. Um, I am learning Korean, so I should know how to pronounce some of these things correctly, but I do mispronounce things a lot. (laughs) And of course, since it's from a different country, there may be some um, inconsistencies because some things do get lost in translation. But as always, let's start with Yu Yong Chul's early life. Yu Yong Chul was born on April 18th, 1970, into a blue collar family in the village of Waha Gochang County in the North Chola province of South Korea. He was told that he was an unplanned baby. Reportedly, his parents didn't want him, and his grandmother actually told him that at one point his mother had considered killing him. Yu's parents divorced when he was seven. He was raised along with his siblings. He had two older brothers and a little sister and they were raised by his grandmother for a few years until they moved in with their father in Mapo district of Seoul. Yu's father was a Vietnam War veteran, returning home with a large savings from his soldier's pay. However, he lost most of it to poor business decisions, but he also ran a comic book shop in Seoul and he also remarried. Where the family lived, the Mapo district, it was a poverty-stricken area that had no electricity or running water at the time. Those who lived in this area would get water from a public well. One of his brothers ran away as their stepmother beat the children. However, she would not touch young Chul. She found that he unnerved her by glaring at her for hours with nothing but hate and contempt in his stare. Eventually, Yong Chul and his little sister ran away from home, living with their mother, who also lived in the Mapo district. According to school records from Seoul Gungdok Elementary School, Yu was quiet and polite. He was also considered very responsible for his age. Even though he ran away from his home with his father, he found himself missing him and would often visit. Not long before becoming an alcoholic, his second wife left him. Unfortunately, Yu's father died in a car accident. This is when Yu decided to focus on his studies and became one of the top students in his class. His disdain for the rich began at a young age. He was often bullied and made fun of because of his poverty, which instilled in him resentment towards the rich. But he also found an interest in the arts during his time in school. He played guitar, sang, painted, and read poetry through elementary school. In 1984, Yu entered middle school, where he continued his passion for the arts. He loved to sing, and at one point he sang in a gospel group at church. 
Along with his friends, they formed a singing group called Evergreen to compete in talent contests. It was also stated that Yu was a good all-around athlete, but sometimes he would pass out from overexertion, to which it was suspected it was because of his poor diet. He was so infatuated with the arts that he applied to a high school that specialized in them. Unfortunately, he was denied admission, and instead he enrolled in a technical high school in 1987. During his second year of high school, Yu stole a guitar as well as a Sony cassette player from a neighbor's house in 1988. Yu was sent to a juvenile detention center for the theft. It was his first crime, and he continued to grow his rap sheet, and he also did not graduate from the technical high school. In 1991, his landlord raised his rent, and in an effort to make up the difference, he broke into an office and stole over $500 in cash and a camera. He spent 10 months in jail for this crime. On Christmas in 1991, he met a masseuse named Miss Huang, and they married in June 1993. But it wasn't long before he committed his next crime. He found a car with the keys in the ignition and stole it, receiving an eight-month jail sentence. In October 1994, his wife gave birth to their son. In 1998, Yu found himself arrested again for forging some official documents and impersonating government officials. While serving his sentence, he dreamed that when he got out, he would build a house for his family and spend time with his young son. Between 1993 and 1995, Yu received treatment as a day patient at the National Mental Hospital in Seoul. There were many references to him having epilepsy to some extent. The blackouts he experienced while playing sports as a youth is speculated to have been epileptic seizures. However, author Lee Eun Yong speculated that Yu has manic depressive disorder. He based this theory on Yu's second brother, who was a manic depressive and took his own life in 1994. Yu still found himself always finding himself in trouble. In March 2000, Yu was arrested once again, but this time it wasn't for theft. His wife was able to overlook his crimes of stealing because, after all, it was a means to provide for their family. So she was able to look over that because he was only stealing to try and provide money to support his family. But the one thing that led to their divorce and drove his wife over the edge with his crimes was when Yu was convicted of raping a 15-year-old girl. He served a three-year, six-month sentence for this crime. When his wife filed for divorce, she also included that he would be barred from any visitation rights to his son. It appears that Yu wasn't the type to look at himself and see the wrongdoings he committed and learn from them or try to better himself. Instead, he blamed everyone else for his mistakes. His resentment for the wealthy and now, because his wife divorced him, a hatred for women brewed within him. While in prison, he would plan the murder of his wife and son as a way to obtain revenge. While serving time for theft and rape, Yu studied the life and crimes of Jung Du Yang who was a serial killer who murdered nine wealthy victims in Busan, Ulsan, and other cities in Gyeongnam province from June 1999 to April 2000. After being released from prison on September 11, 2002, Yu went to his mother's home until he could find somewhere he could call his own. In order to make money to live, he would stroll through numerous red light districts of Seoul to extort money from pimps and prostitutes using a fake police badge. Once he had enough money, 
He settled down in a studio apartment in the neighborhood he grew up in. A more telling sign of Yu's personality was his obsession with nude drawings and portraits of women. One day he walked outside his apartment and found a calling card. These calling cards weren't secret as they were everywhere. You could find them on car windshields. They were just thrown everywhere basically. And on the card, there was always an erotic photo of a beautiful woman promising hot sex and a number to call. So I thought this part would seem kind of like a random thing to state, but it is relevant to the story. It comes back around, so just wait. During this time after his release, he also spent it gathering stray dogs and he would bludgeon them to death using them as practice. You felt that the wealthy were the cause of all that was wrong with Korean society, and the people were to blame for his life's misery. He would beat them like the dogs and planned to murder over 100 people. It wasn't until 2003 that he decided he would finally seek the revenge he so desperately wanted. He broke into the house that his ex-wife and son were living in. But when he saw his son, he couldn't bring himself to kill him. You thought his son was too adorable to murder. In that instant, he decided to spare his son's life. He then searched for his ex-wife. But again, he found himself unable to kill her. As he watched her drinking a beer and eating a single piece of seaweed, he felt nothing but pity for her and decided to leave her unharmed too. As he failed to commit the murders, you found that he still held a lot of pent-up anger because he could not bring himself to kill his family for revenge. He decided to attack others, the ones he hated and held the most resentment toward since he was a child. Becoming a seasoned killer of dogs, he became experienced at violence and death. Yu's homemade hammer became his weapon of choice, but his vengeance was not meant for just anyone. His victims had to meet certain criteria that would develop into his method of operating. On September 24th, 2003, around mid-morning, Yu Yong Chul rode the subway to Apkuchong Dong Station, which is the most affluent district in Seoul. From the station, he walked the streets of the Shinja neighborhood, looking for a church. When he spotted one, he searched nearby for an expensive-looking house, something that would indicate that the owners were wealthy. The one you chose looked easy to break into. The home followed the normal two-story house profile that you find in Seoul, which features a walled-in courtyard where the occupants can either grow herbs or flowers or just provide a little greenery that would contrast to the paved cityscape of Seoul. The house you cased had a little garden, but most importantly, for him at least, was that it did not have a security system. Watching the house for roughly 10 minutes, it appeared that the only people who lived there were an elderly couple. He climbed over the back wall, wearing gloves, and entered through the front door, equipped with his homemade hammer and a 6-inch bladed knife. The home belonged to 72-year-old Li, who was an honorary suk -myung university professor, along with his 68-year-old wife. Yu scoped out the second floor to make sure there were no other occupants in the house. When he found no one else, he went down the stairs and into the master bedroom, where he stabbed the professor in the throat. Miss Lee screamed in horror. Strangely, Yu tried to calm her at that moment and told her everything was okay. But no sooner than the wife reached for her dying husband, you smashed their skulls with his homemade hammer. 
After committing these harrowing acts, he made sure the victims were dead, locked the bedroom door behind him, and left through the front door. Yu tried to clean the blood off his pants using a towel that he had taken from the house. But then he remembered something. He forgot his knife inside, behind the locked bedroom door. He had no choice but to return to the crime scene, kicking open the door to fetch his knife and place it in his bag. However, he noticed that he left a footprint on the door and was able to partially remove it. To further his devious plan and confuse the police, he flung open the wardrobe and tossed the contents around the room. He did not steal any money or jewelry or he, he didn't steal anything for except for maybe the towel. But when he arrived at Apgu Jongdong Station, he went to the subway restroom where he cleaned himself and made sure to wash the blood off the tools. Two weeks later, on October 9th, Yu decided to strike again. He took the subway to Pulguang Station and then a taxi to Guki Tunnel. Again, he decided to walk around until he found a church and then a wealthy looking house in the affluent neighborhood. This house also had a surrounding wall and an inner garden with no security system. Standing outside, he carefully watched the movements of the house's occupants through the window. Wearing his gloves, he climbed the wall, then carefully walked toward the house with his homemade hammer ready in hand. The elderly woman, Mr. Ko's mother, may have heard the front door open as she stepped out of the bathroom. Perhaps she was looking to see who came home when you smashed the 85-year-old woman three or four times in the head near the front door. At that moment, the 60-year-old housewife came down the stairs into the living room where you kicked her in the stomach twice. He then asked if there was anyone else in the house, to which she stated that her husband and son were upstairs. He then proceeded to hammer her skull until he was certain she was dead. When he finished, he started up the stairs to the second floor, where he ran into Mr. Ko's 35-year-old son, forcing him to kneel down before striking him eight to nine times with the hammer and leaving him on the stairs. He searched the second floor for the husband, as the woman claimed her husband was upstairs also, but he didn't find anyone else. But he did find a safe and scattered the contents around the room to mask the homicide as a homicide slash robbery. After this, he went around the house, making sure none of the victims were alive, and then meticulously cleaned his footprints with a towel before walking back to the Guki Tunnel and taking a taxi back to Pukwang Station. It was only a week later when you would hop on the subway to Solung Station. It was October 16th at roughly 1 o'clock in the afternoon when he walked the Samsung neighborhood of the Gangnam District, which is known to be an area occupied by the wealthy. Just like the previous two murders, he walked around the neighborhood until he found a church. Then he scouted a house with a big garden and a surrounding wall. Again, he climbed the wall, wearing his gloves, and approached the front door. The 69-year-old wife of a millionaire named Miss Yu came out from the house to get the mail. As she walked back inside her home, she was unaware that her assailant crept into the house right behind her. Once inside, he threatened her with his knife asking if anybody else was home. She said no one else was there, so he dragged her into the bathroom and struck her head with his hammer three to four times. Just like the previous two instances, you then scattered items in the master bedroom to make the crime appear to be a robbery gone wrong, even though he left empty-handed. 
Then he wiped the bloodstains off his shoes and cleaned the footprints from the floor. He left the scene, taking the subway as usual. The victim was found alive by her son about an hour later, but died later after being taken to the hospital. At this point, his method of operation emerged. Unfortunately for investigators, his pattern would change very soon. It would be nearly a month before you decided to kill again. November 18th at 11 in the morning, you took the subway to Hansung University Station. He searched for a house near a church, but this time he noticed a small police station in an alley. He thought this would be a prime place to commit his next crime, because the residents would perceive the area as safe. He thought their guard would be down since there was a police station close. Just like the other houses he targeted, it had a small garden within a surrounding wall. You watched the house for the occupants before climbing the back wall, wearing his gloves. This is when you heard a baby cry from inside the house, which confirmed that, at the very least, there were two people inside the home at that moment. After entering through the front door, he went up to the second floor, but didn't find anyone. As he started back downstairs, 53-year-old housekeeper, Miss Bay, saw him and asked who he was. Taking out his knife, he ordered her into the master bedroom. That's when he found the owner of the house, an 87-year-old man named Mr. Kim, who was lying in the bed. You quickly struck him in the head with his hammer. Miss Bay was terrified and held the baby tightly in her arms as you tried to pry the baby from her grasp. Once he had the baby, he laid the child on the sofa, covering it with a blanket in an attempt to muffle its cries before attacking the housekeeper with his hammer. When the adult occupants were dead, he began searching the house to find a safe. Using a golf club and pruning shears, he broke it open. However, while he did this, he accidentally cut himself and split his middle knuckle on his right hand. He grew worried that the police could track him using a DNA test. So, he set the room on fire using newspapers and clothing. Yu was covered in blood from this event. So, he took the man's black jacket, put it on, and left the crime scene. But instead of immediately leaving the area, he stood at a distance and watched the house for about 30 minutes. He could not see any flames from the fire he started. However, he saw a woman who looked like a family member entering the house, so that's when he decided to leave. While he left thinking the fire was unsuccessful, it did manage to destroy the bodies and the first floor but unknowingly left behind a set of footprints as well as an image of himself wearing the stolen jacket on CCTV. Unfortunately, the image only captured him from behind, which gave investigators even more guesswork. I forgot to include this in my notes, but the baby did survive. The baby was saved. Not long after murdering the elderly man and his housekeeper, you called a phone sex establishment, one of the calling cards I discussed earlier. Through this number, he became acquainted with a woman named Miss Kim. It appeared that she was interested in him, so the couple lived together for two months, and eventually you proposed to her. By this point in their relationship, Kim learned of his criminal past, his mental instability, his educational background, and his prior divorce, which caused her to reject his affections. She even told him to never see her again. But to be honest, I am surprised that she stayed with him because she had to have learned of all of these things while they were dating, while they were, they were you know, living together. So, for her to just wait until he proposed is kind of strange. 
Between his recent breakup and his divorce, it made you bitter. He thought about the job that his ex-wife and his girlfriend had. One was a masseuse and the other was a phone sex worker. This event, including the professions of the women he once loved, attributed to his next targets. In January, you was arrested for theft at a sauna. He was briefly held at the Sodemun police station. However, they failed to check his criminal record. If they had looked into his criminal record, they would have seen that you served a total of 11 years in prison for 14 different crimes, including theft, fraud, and assault. Instead, the police released him, thinking he was just a petty thief, failing to connect him to the series of killings throughout the city. After his January release, it is speculated that this gave him the confidence to begin his killing spree again because on February 6th, at roughly 7 p.m., you took a taxi to the Imundong neighborhood hunting for a victim. He approached a 25-year-old woman who was standing in front of a restaurant. He thought she looked like a prostitute as she walked down an alleyway. He asked her where she was going. I'm going shopping, she replied. You then showed her a forged police ID card, asking her to go to a bar with him. She didn't trust him and replied, You're not a cop, you crazy bastard. This statement angered you, who went after her. She ran away, almost reaching a nearby restaurant, before falling and screaming for help. He stabbed her five times in the chest. Yu's new targets for his vengeance now focused on the women in Korea's sex industry. Even though prostitution is illegal in South Korea, the industry is everywhere from the smallest country towns to the largest red light districts in Seoul, which that is something that every country has. I mean, that's something that can be found everywhere in every country. The girls in this trade range from high school girls soliciting their services in internet chat rooms to housewives. The circumstances in which they end up in this profession is actually kind of sad as the teenagers want to make enough money to buy a new cell phone while housewives want to make extra cash for their children's tuition. Because in Korea they actually have these things called a hakwon and it's basically just a cram school to make sure that their kids excel in school and make good grades so that they can get into a good high school, they can get into a good college. So that that is actually kind of sad that a housewife would feel the need that they have to do that for that reason. But again, it is important to the parent that they try to give their children everything that they possibly can. However, others who got into this profession want to pay off debt. From my research, it seems like those kinds, you know, like the teenagers that want to make enough money to buy a new cell phone, or the housewives, or the ones that want to pay off debt, these seem like, like a low percentage. Most of these girls became slaves in servitude to pimps that buy and sell the women and keep them imprisoned in brothels. Most of these poor women didn't even have a choice. They were abducted and trafficked, basically. So in Korea, a phone room can either be a phone service, which is similar to, you know, the 1-900 numbers in the US, or an actual place. A small, ominous, dark room with a telephone, a TV, and a video player loaded with porn, containing a lounge chair, and some tissues. And you know what those are for. <laughs> so how this works is the customer usually pays by the hour, enters the room, and waits for a woman to call on the phone. They talk and there is always that possibility that the customer could actually meet the woman after. 
for even more services. So Yu Yong Chul knew the nature of the phone sex room. Everyone was basically anonymous as the customers do not want to be identified. The pimps and workers don't want to be identified. So this would soon become his contact point where he would find the same type of woman that rejected his affections and made him feel worthless. His new plan was that he would call these women, persuade them, and then make them pay for his actions that caused him to have what he deemed a miserable life. On March 16th, he called one of these phone sex fronts and had a woman named Jin Hee sent over to his apartment in Makbul. This new plan would appear to work better for him because he did not have to leave his house except for disposing the body. He didn't have to go searching for churches. He didn't have to go searching for the wealthy house. He didn't have to break and enter. He didn't have to stage it to make it look like a robbery. So this seemed a choice that was a lot better for him. So after using the woman's services, he fatally strangled the woman and dismembered her corpse. Using a jackknife, he started removing her head and hung it over a trash can to drain the blood. He then cut her arms, legs, and torso in the shower with the water running and music playing. Yu divided the dismembered parts into ten small black trash bags and four larger black trash bags. He then took a taxi and dumped her remains on a trail under a tree behind Sulkang University Library. He was careful to keep the bags in case they contained his fingerprints. Sometime after this, Yu purchased some counterfeit Viagra pills in the Huanhatong Goblin Market. On the evening of April 13th, he returned to the man who sold him the fake Viagra, named An Jae-sun. Posing as a police officer, Yu showed his fake ID and threatened Mr. An to gain a bribe from him. An did not trust Yu as he was used to spotting fake IDs. I mean, he was selling some shady things, so I mean, he's kind of, he kind of got used to spotting, you know, what fake IDs look like and knowing how the cops operate, you know, they usually have a partner with them, right? So, An told him that he would make an inquiry at the nearby police station. Of course, this angered you because he caught his bluff. He wrestled him and forced the man into his own van, handcuffing him inside. Yu drove the van back to Mapo, parking near his house so he could grab his hammer, knife, and gloves. He then went back to the vehicle and drove to an underground parking lot at Sekang Orthopedic Surgery Clinic. Yu began stabbing An in the head and neck with his knife. Believing the man was dead, he moved him under the seat, but An kicked him. Yu stabbed An in the thigh, tried to put a bag over him, and then began hitting him in the head about 20 times with his hammer. Yu then walked home to clean himself before returning to the van, then washed off the van like cleaning the blood mist off the windows and covering Jason with clothes and newspapers before driving to Wolmi Island. Wolmi Island has a carnival-like atmosphere because it was built to create a tourist spot. So the location has like a lot of street vendors. It has four amusement parks and just so much more. It has a bunch of restaurants and seafood, you know, seafood places and, you know, the works. You parked An's van at Samho Petroleum between two tanker trucks in Buksongdong and proceeded to dismember his body. First, by sawing off his hands, he then placed the hands in a plastic bag, tossing them into the rocks against the shoreline. Returning to the van, he set it on fire. He wanted to create an explosion with the two tankers, but it didn't work. So as he stood watching from a distance, 
he left once firefighters arrived at the scene and took a taxi to Bupyong Station. He intentionally told the taxi driver to drop him off at this station in case the driver remembered his face. Then he took another taxi home. There was a series of prostitute murders following the last impromptu slaying. He found using the phone sex industry to be less riskier for his horrid activity. The women came to him rather than you roaming the streets, you know, looking for the houses and churches. It seemed like it was a lot safer, especially when he was just wanting to... Especially when he just wanted to, you know, like, kill one person, like he did in Im Dung, and to Mr. An. Those impromptu killings were very risky in his opinion. I think all of them are risky, but, you know, that's just me. <laughs> On May 8th, he called an escort girl to his home. He partook in her offered services before he took out some handcuffs. Which, actually, if you listen to any of the... If you watch the documentary on Netflix about the raincoat killer, he's actually stated that he never partook in the services that the prostitutes offered because he was afraid that he would leave DNA. Which, that sounds logical, but many people, including investigators, believe that he did do the nasty with them. So, I'm just saying. So back to the story. On May 8th, he called the escort girl and they partook in her offered services before he took out some handcuffs. The woman became uncomfortable when he brought the handcuffs out. So he led her into the bathroom where he began to tickle her. Now when she bent over from being tickled, he struck her with his hammer. The most grotesque detail from this incident. I mean, it made my stomach churn when I read this. I literally felt like I was about to vomit when I read this part. When he began to decapitate her, she was still alive. He continued to dismember her body, cutting her fingertips off with a pair of scissors and throwing them into the toilet, then flushing them. You would then mutilate her body into 16 to 18 pieces and then buried her remains behind a construction site in Sotemungu. He did this to nine other women until July 13th, 2004. Each body would take two trips, burying them in shallow graves and marking them in a way that only you could identify that that was the spot he had buried someone. And he did this so that he wouldn't bury two bodies in the same spot. He would also keep the victim's cell phones so he could avoid using his own number for calls. Not entirely suspicious because many customers who frequent such businesses generally use a fake name. They also probably try to call from numbers that are not registered in their name. The seven women he first murdered were from the sex industry, but the last two girls were actually from a massage parlor that he coerced to come to his apartment using his fake police ID. In the southwestern part of Seoul, four stabbing murders and one knife attack happened on rainy evenings. Four of the five events happened on a Thursday night. This led to the perpetrator gaining the name Thursday Night Killer and the rainy night murderer. It appeared that these crimes had no motive because there were no items stolen from the victims and none of them were raped. The women were scared in early 2004. They were going home earlier than usual. Sales for security alarms, security systems, gas guns, and pepper sprays, all of the sales for those things increased drastically. Authorities confessed that they had very little to go on because there was a lack of evidence and little to no witnesses. As the murder count and missing persons kept rising, police were completely stumped. But probably the most strange thing about this case was that Yu was finally caught and turned in by the help of a pimp. Well, it probably isn't 
really that too bizarre or strange because, I mean, you was basically ruining his business. As I've stated before, you would call prostitution businesses with different names, but the various businesses were owned by the same man, Mr. No. No thought it was odd that one of the girls had not been heard from by anyone after taking a job and thought maybe she had been kidnapped. He also found it strange that two other women had suddenly gone missing after answering calls from a number ending in 6523. Playing detective, he then called a nearby massage parlor and one of the owners claimed that one of their workers was missing after receiving a call from the same number. It was later determined that the phone number belonged to a deceased mother of a missing girl who disappeared in late June. With this information, No contacted Inspector Yang of the Mobile Investigation Unit, who told No that if the number calls again, to let him know. At 2 a.m. on July 15th, a call from the same number came in. No immediately contacted his colleagues, seniors, and Inspector Yang. All of the men split up with different women in a taxi, following them to the back of Xinchun Grand Market. Yu would call to complain that, that the woman was too tall. He preferred short, slim women because they were easier to dismember and discard. As Yu called to complain about the selected women, Inspector Yang searched men's phone numbers in the parks and alleys in the area to try and find the culprit. Yu told No on the phone that he liked the third woman they sent and told them for her to meet him in the alley behind the Grand Market. When he appeared at the location, the men body searched him while Yang handcuffed him and quickly put him in the car. During the car ride, the men noted that Yu was suspiciously chewing vigorously. So the men tried to stop him and pry his mouth open. They found that he was trying to destroy several business trip massage cards. This is when his cell phone fell out and they found the phone's number ending in 6523. Yu was sent to Seoul Metropolitan Police Agency's Mobile Investigation Unit and treated as a thief at the time because they had very little evidence for the murders. The men who helped in Yu's arrest contributed greatly to the investigation and were able to verify that Yu impersonated authorities. It wasn't long that Yu confessed to the killings and said he killed 26 people, all starting with the elderly people in Xinjiang and ending with the last woman he killed two days before. But while Yu was in custody, he feigned to have a gimp leg and pretended to have a seizure. His acting seemed to work as officers took pity on him and uncuffed him during interrogation. But when he was left unsupervised with the door open, he escaped from their custody very easily. After escaping, he went to his house to try and destroy evidence. He then bought 360 sleeping pills and went to a motel. It took 11 to 12 hours for authorities to capture him again after mobile patrol saw him at a roundabout crosswalk. So after his second capture, Yu confessed all of his crimes to the police. He added that he would talk to the victims for about an hour, asking them about their personal lives before killing them. But throughout this time in custody, he changed his story many times so many times that it basically makes it to where you you can't go off of what the perpetrator says. However, he did agree to lead police to the bodies. When authorities brought you out on their little journey, they made him wear a yellow raincoat and mask to conceal his identity. This is where the raincoat killer was coined by international media 
There were many news reporters covering the story. You looked at one of the cameras and said, women shouldn't be sluts, and the rich should know what they've done. During his confessions, you claimed that he had eaten some of the internal organs of four of his victims to supposedly either cleanse his spirit or cure his epilepsy. Investigators found no proof to support these claims, but supposedly four of the corpses had no organs. So it's up for debate whether he ate the organs or not. I mean, there's not really any proof to support the claims. So he also admitted to authorities that if he would not have been caught, he would have kept killing. Authorities received a lot of backlash from the public with the way the case was handled and how it ultimately was solved by a pimp. Hopefully it, it has changed since then, but back in the early 2000s, there was a lack of communication between police departments. Normally, the departments would keep to their own jurisdiction and would not inform the other jurisdiction or collaborate with the other jurisdiction. So cases weren't easily linked across jurisdictions because of this. Hopefully after the raincoat killer, they changed these. The police departments also generally kept such crimes quiet until they solved it because it was a way to maximize promotions within their departments, which I'm not entirely sure how all of that works with getting promotions and by keeping the murders and crimes secret until they catch the culprit. I'm not sure how that helps maximize the opportunities for a promotion. They explain it a little in the Raincoat Killer documentary. So if you are interested in learning more of the authorities side of the story, I would recommend watching that. So at this time period, Korean police also relied heavily on confessions rather than forensic evidence. All of these factors made this case more difficult to identify and capture you. While performing the autopsies, Dr. Bak Hui Kyung, the forensic examiner, questioned how a human being could be so evil. She closely observed the victims' smashed heads and mutilated bodies to theorize that the killings were purely out of anger and rage. She and a lot of people were baffled by how someone could retain that amount of hate, how someone could feel that much rage. Every time you confessed little bits and pieces of his story to authorities, Investigators would try to corroborate what he said, but the only things they had to work with was what you told them and the dead bodies he pointed out. There were particles of human flesh that was taken from the hammer, which DNA tests matched some of the recovered victims. Police were also able to determine that the footprints left at the Hyehwadong crime scene were from him by measuring Yu's feet and shoe size. Authorities confessed that they had very little physical evidence that linked Yu with his self-confessed murders. On July 25th, he told investigators that he was responsible for the murder of the woman in Imundong on February 6th but he kept changing his story, which makes it impossible for authorities to determine whether the man is the culprit or not. He told them that he murdered 26 people. You also stated that he killed people in Incheon and in Busan without giving any other dates or details on the claims. So police had no way of confirming whether any of these claims were true. Yu was also interviewed by a criminal psychologist who stated that Yu was antisocial and distrusted the mores of society. 
He also claimed that you show little guilt or remorse for his crimes and claimed that if given the chance, he would have killed 100 more women. The police charged you with 21 counts of murder, burglary, impersonating a police officer, arson, and improperly disposing of corpses. Unfortunately, with the evidence and the confessions received from you, authorities were not able to link him to the knife murders that were coined as the rainy night and Thursday night killer. It took the police 10 days to finalize their investigation, but even though the murderer was caught, there was still unrest and outrage from the public who were scrutinizing authorities. On July 26, 2004, police prepared to turn over their case to prosecutors as you was transferred to the prosecutor's office. Outside, there were mass amounts of reporters, photojournalists, and just normal everyday citizens waiting to see the man who claimed so many lives. A 51-year-old woman who was the mother of one of you's victims screamed at authorities. The police's insincere and incompetent investigation killed my daughter. If you arrested him earlier, my daughter would not have died. With an umbrella, she stormed up the stairs to rush at you. A police officer swiftly kicked at her, which landed to her chest, and she fell down the steps. The incident was captured on live television and caused outrage to soar throughout the country. The Seoul Metropolitan Police Agency responded the next day with an apology and stated that the umbrella was mistaken for a weapon. To be fair to both sides, I will say that it was an unfortunate incident. I cannot blame the mother for wanting to hurt the person who caused her great pain. And while I believe the officer could have handled the situation better, in retrospect, he was trying to keep himself and the prisoner safe. But again, the officer should have handled the situation better. The officer involved in the incident stated, I tried to stop her from coming towards you. It was not my intention to hurt her. Even so, other officers who were there stated that the incident was a setup orchestrated by reporters from Japan's Fuji TV who persuaded the grieving mother to rush at you and yank the mask off his face so they could get good footage of his face. But a staff member from Fuji TV merely laughed at the claims, so it is difficult to say whether this actually happened or is just speculated. You had the audacity to complain to the National Human Rights Commission of Korea while he was in custody, claiming that his basic rights were violated because he was kept in chains, not able to use the bathroom, and was under CCTV surveillance 24-7. The public couldn't care less of his claims and the NHRCK publicly stated that no intention of looking into his claims. But on July 29th, you refused to talk to the police anymore and decided to go on a hunger strike. While no one really cared, this was not a good thing for the prosecution. Most of their case was built on what you had confessed to them. When you decided to stop talking, they couldn't gain any more information. Because they had very little physical evidence on their own, they were entirely dependent on his confessions. On September 6th, you finally appeared in court for the charges against him. Instead of putting up a fight or sitting silently, he admitted to his guilt. He further described how he dismembered his victims and stated that he killed two more people in addition to the 21 counts he was being charged with. After retelling the gruesome details, it was as if nothing could hurt him. He kept this cavalier attitude and could not be bothered to care about the lives he took, the lives he ruined, or his own defense. He stated, 
I gave up my life. You, the judges, are not the kind of persons who can punish my sins. I wish this was the last day of the trial. I refuse to appear in court next time. Before leaving the courtroom, you addressed everyone in the room. I would like to apologize to the victims for what I have done. I am sorry. Korean law does not allow suspects to boycott their own court hearings, so Yu was brought back to appear in court on September 20th. He stated, I don't want to attend the trial anymore, but one of the judges chastised him. It is not up to you to decide whether you attend the trial or not. During this hearing, Yu claimed that he murdered five more people, which included an adolescent and a pregnant woman, but he also stated that he had previously fabricated a story because the police promised to protect his son until university age. So I lied to them about killing a woman in Imundong, which I didn't do. Just as the court was about to adjourn, Yu leaped over the railing and charged toward the judges, yelling that he was not going to attend the next hearing. The judges quickly ran from their chairs, but as soon as Yu reached the desk, he slipped and was rushed by roughly 20 guards, handcuffed and dragged from the courtroom. Either during the court proceedings or after being dragged from the courtroom, you passed two notes to a reporter and a prison guard. The notes contained his remorse for the victims' families, and he repented for his actions. But the contents also seemed to hint that he was about to end his life. So prison guards tightened their 24-hour watch on Yu's cell. On October 3rd, Yu used an electrical wire that he removed from a wall-mounted fan and tried to strangle himself around midnight. This attempt was immediately prevented by authorities. He again passed a note to a prison guard that he requested to be submitted to the Seoul Central District Court, which stated that he had nothing more to say and refused to attend his hearing. Authorities were baffled by his demeanor. While Korean law does not allow a suspect to boycott their own hearing, it does allow the court to try and convict a person who is absent. However, authorities did not want to press the issue any further because of Yu's actions in the largest criminal case of the year. So they decided to postpone the trial until the following week on October 11th. In court again on October 25th, a spectator swore at Yu as he entered the courtroom. Yu snapped and lunged for the person as ten guards grabbed him, smashing two wooden chairs. Yu was immediately taken out of the courtroom to allow the air to settle. But before allowing him back in, authorities forced you to sign a written statement, I will not cause any further agitation. Once he was allowed back inside the courtroom, you stared at the families of the victims and said, They were abnormal women. They deserved to be caught. On the final day of Yu's hearing, November 29th, prosecutors demanded he receive the death penalty. They argued that Yu ceased to be a normal member of society when he began his motiveless killing spree. They also reminded the court of Yu's previous statements that he would have killed a hundred more people if he wasn't caught and that his victims deserved to be caught by him. Yu's response to the death penalty request was anticlimactic. My actions cannot be justified. If we live in a society where people like me can live a good life, there will not be another Yu Yong Chul. I am thankful for the prosecutor's request for the death penalty. I will be repenting what I have done until I die. On December 13th, Yu was aloof as the verdict was handed down. With most of the 20 victims being women and the elderly, Yu's case is 
a serious crime that has no parallel in the nation's history. The Seoul Central District Court affirmed capital punishment for Yu Yong Chul for 20 of 21 murder charges against him. We sentenced him to death having considered his motive, the method of murder, and the shock his killing spree gave to the bereaved families and to the public. Even though he felt sorry for the bereaved families of the victims at the end of the trial, the court acquitted him for the murder of the 24-year-old Im Moon Dong woman, stating that there was a lack of objective evidence except for Yu's own vague confession, a testimony that Yu later repeatedly denied. Another charge of theft at a sauna in Seoul was dropped as the court cited the statements given by the witness may be inaccurate. The prosecutor strongly objected to the not guilty decision of the Im Moon Dong killing. They claimed that since Yu confessed to the murder without interrogation or torture, then it must be true. Adding that there were details of the story Yu provided that only the killer would have known. Senior prosecutor Lee Dong Ho said, Nobody forced him to say that he had killed the woman in Im Moon Dong. We are taking this to court again. The prosecution stated it would appeal to a higher court on the Im Moon Dong murder case. The defense attorney of Yu Yong Chul would appeal the guilty verdict to the Korean Supreme Court, while political parties in the National Assembly argued for the abolition of the death penalty. Yu departed the courtroom. His demeanor was detached and neutral. He would be the first person to be hanged in South Korea since the mass executions on December 31st, 1997, when 23 convicts were put to death. On June 9th, Yu heard the final verdict of the Supreme Court with his death sentence being confirmed. The prosecution's appeal of the Im Moon Dong case was rejected. 17 days later, the National Assembly received an official letter from the Ministry of Justice that criticized the current legislative motions to abolish capital punishment. Within the letter, there was an indirect insinuation of Yu Yong Chul. If brutal murders are not condemned to capital punishment, then it will go against the public's feelings of justice and victims' grudges, and their feeling of private revenge will increase. Currently, Yu Yong Chul is on death row with 60 other convicts and is detained at Seoul Detention Center. What are your thoughts about this case? Do you think Yu Yong Chul received the sentence he deserved? Leave your thoughts and requests in the comments. And don't forget to subscribe to stay up to date with the latest bizarre and spine chilling episodes. Stay safe and I will see you for the next episode. Bye!